Just imagine you needed a life-saving bandage for yourself or for your child, but geopolitics, geopolitics prevented you from getting it. It sounds like a strange hypothetical, but that's exactly what's happening in Iran right now. Last month, the United Nations criticized a Swedish medical manufacturer for breaching their international responsibility when they decided to stop all their shipments to Iran, including specific bandages that only they make for people who suffer from a severe and life-threatening skin condition that's known as EB and often affects children. Already, according to an Iranian NGO, dozens of patients, mostly kids, have died since the company stopped its exports to Iran in 2018. If you remember, 2018 was when then-President Donald Trump tore up the nuclear deal and reimposed U.S. sanctions on Iran that had previously been lifted. The thing is, as defenders of sanctions like to point out, there are humanitarian exceptions to them, including for things like those bandages. But the Swedish company told the Iranians they decided not to conduct any business with relation to Iran for the time being. This also applies to business conducted under any form of exceptions to the U.S. economic sanctions. See, the web of U.S. sanctions against Iran, around 1,600 imposed by Trump alone, 1,600, is so large, so expansive, so threatening that companies who do have humanitarian exceptions would rather totally pull out of Iran, rather stay away than risk violating any of those sanctions, even accidentally. They don't want to upset the United States. And it's had a catastrophic effect on the Iranian people. A Human Rights Watch report from 2019 found that despite the exemptions, broad U.S. sanctions were restricting Iranians' access to critical drugs for epilepsy and chemotherapy. And as Iranians suffered through one of the world's worst COVID-19 outbreaks, it was sanctions that restricted the country from importing medical equipment and later even vaccines. That is to say nothing of the devastating economic effects that sanctions have had on the country as a whole. But it does help explain why Iran's new, more conservative administration has agreed to return to the nuclear negotiating table this week. Right now, in Vienna, Iran and world powers are in their latest round of talks to try and restore or negotiate a new version of the 2015 nuclear deal. But Iran's new government is still refusing direct talks with the U.S., which has resulted in the bizarre situation where the U.S. negotiating team in Vienna receives readouts each day from European partners while sitting at a separate hotel in Vienna. Weird. At the moment, Tehran is insisting the U.S. lift all its Trump-era sanctions, something the Biden administration has so far not signaled it's going to offer. But how much should a new nuclear deal with Iran matter to the U.S.? According to a new interview with a former Israeli military intelligence official, a lot. The former Intel research chief told the Times of Israel that the Iran deal, even with its flaws, had in fact rolled back the Iran nuclear program significantly more than any other clandestine activity aimed at doing the same, and that Trump's maximum pressure policy was a catastrophe. This former official also said Israel's anti-deal policy has been a failure. Not my words, the words of a former Iranian intelligence official. So where do negotiations in Vienna stand after day two? What are the Iranians offering? And is the Biden administration doing enough to make a deal? Joining me now, joining me now to discuss this is Vali Nasser, professor of international affairs and Middle East studies at Johns Hopkins University. He also served as a senior State Department advisor in the Obama administration. Uh, Vali, welcome back to the show. For those of us who are hoping the U.S. and Iran reach a deal, but haven't been following the negotiations all of this year and the ones this week with Iran's new government. Where, in your view, do things stand? Is there any chance that something positive comes out of these talks and comes out of them soon? Well, uh, I think uh, uh, we shouldn't expect too much from this round of talks. Uh, I think the best news would be if the talks continue. There's a new t Iranian team that has come uh, to Vienna for the talks. They're not going to immediately cut a deal. Uh, the United States and Iran agreed on, on a large number of sanctions to be lifted, but it's the last few that are most critical. And I think one of the most important issues is that the Iranians are afraid of getting into another deal with the United States, and then the U.S. Uh, doing what uh, Trump did one more time, you know, just pull out of the deal. And this time, what, if, if the United States comes, comes back in, it, it will have abilities and powers to, to hurt Iran and to manage the deal uh, that Trump left behind when he left the deal. So the Iranians want a deal, but they're very skittish, and they're not sure at all that whether this is a trap. And at the same time, the United States thinks that Iran has now so far advanced on its nuclear program that it, unless it agrees to some additional safeguards, the old deal is no longer enough to contain its program. Yes. Uh. 
And just listening to you speak there, I don't know whether to laugh or cry at the realism you've injected into this conversation that the really good thing we can hope for is that just the talks continue. It's such a low bar, but you're right to point it out. Um, Valley, we know how important cutting a deal is for Iran. The country's economy has been decimated by the U.S. sanctions regime. In inflation is so high there right now that rents alone have risen nearly 50 percent in the last year. So that's Iranian. That's Iran's interest. What is the U.S.'s main interest to strike a deal right now? There's all this talk of a plan B and alternatives. Is the U.S. as vested in this as much as it was in 2015 under Obama? I think so, and perhaps even more, because plan B essentially means risking war with Iran, risking things that we don't know what the outcome would be. For an administration that's bogged down at home with divisions in Senate and Congress over the economy, over the pandemic, wanting to focus on China, the last thing that they want is another major crisis in the Middle East. And Iran's nuclear program is the single biggest point of crisis in the Middle East. It's the only issue which could get the United States into another forever war, into another prolonged, unknown catastrophe in the region. So even though the U.S. talks tough, it too needs a deal. It too needs at least a minimal stability. So when I say that the best news is for the talks to continue, even if they can't get to a big deal, there is a possibility that they could get into a mini deal when, where Iran may get some sanctions relief, the U.S. may get some limitations on Iran's nuclear program, and at least they're not rushing down into catastrophe uh, that, that currently seems to be the, the case. I think the failure of the talks really, really would be bad for both Iran and for the uh, Biden administration. Vali, we talk a lot about Trump and what he did vis-a-vis -vis Iran, uh, but you worked in the Obama administration from 2009 to 2011, and during that time, in 2010, Obama signed the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions Accountability and Divestment Act of 2010, considered the toughest sanctions ever passed by Congress. Among other things, the law was designed to penalize any company that supplied Iran with gasoline. When we look at how Iranians are suffering under sanctions today, that's on Obama, too, isn't it? We can't just blame Trump for this. No, uh, uh, we can't. And, and we have to also realize that, that Iran is now a domestic pol political issue in the U.S. I mean, one of the reasons that the Biden administration does not want to lift all the sanctions, is very, is very reluctant to get into a deal with Iran, is not just because of the foreign policy security aspects of it. It's because it also needs to manage a highly divided Senate uh, at this moment uh, where yes. uh, it's under a lot of pressure. It doesn't want to go to the American public and to, to the Senate and Congress and explain and defend the deal with Iran. So so, so definitely we're, we're, uh, Iran is one of those cases where our domestic politics is a huge hindrance. And and so that, the, that Iranians actually point to that legislation by Obama as bad faith, as you were negotiating to improve relations while you were also putting sanctions for no better reason than to assuage Congress. Yes, good point. And Republicans openly say all the time, uh, well, whatever this passed by Obama or Biden will just reverse, which is an insane way for a country to make foreign policy or, you know, uh, do negotiations on the international stage. Uh, Valley, Barack Obama also famously repeated the line that Joe Biden and co repeat today that all options are on the table when it comes to Iran, all options. I get why they think they have to say that. But surely there is no military solution to the Iranian nuclear program. I mean, we just ended a disastrous 20-year-long war in Afghanistan in defeat. A war with Iran would make Afghanistan look like a walk in the park, would it not? It would. And, and look, uh, the United States, the lesson we have to learn from all these wars is that we can see how war starts and we know how to start them. But we then, then we cannot control what the outcome is and we don't know how yes. to get out. And, and, I, and, and we have to think about that when we say all options are on, are on the table. Because if there is no deal, and if we end up, let's say, having to bomb Iranian facilities, not only they may take the program underground, but what if they retaliate like they did for the killing of General Soleimani by hitting something? And then, you know, you're on an escalation cycle. And before that, the United States has to pack up its tent from uh, East Asia and, and refocus on the Middle East and put pull all of its eggs into a war with a country of 85 million people whose capital is two mountain ranges and 2,000 miles away from, from the nearest, uh, uh, nearest uh, seaport. So 
When we talk about the prospect of military action, we have to talk about Israel. Uh, Israel is not part of the Iran deal or the JCPOA, as it's known. It's not part of the negotiations in Vienna, but it does have something to say about all this. Uh, have mm -hmm. a listen to uh, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, who sent a video message to those in Vienna. Iran will be arriving at the negotiation table in Vienna, and there are those who think they deserve to have their sanctions removed and hundreds of billions of dollars poured right into their rotten regime. They're wrong. Iran deserves no rewards, no bargain deals, and no sanctions relief in return for their brutality. That's Naftali Bennett. And then you have the prominent DC-based Iran hawk, Mark Dubowitz, tweeting that he predicts the Biden administration's failed policy with Iran will give Israel no choice but to attack Iran's nuclear weapons facilities. Uh, there are no weapons facilities, according to the U.S. intelligence community. Just fact-checking that. Uh, he says reports already suggest, uh, you know, there are reports already suggesting that Israel, Israelis were behind a cyber attack at the Natanz facility earlier this year. Vali, how worried are you that Israel will attack Iran? I think it's, it's a possibility is always there, but that's, again, a danger for the United States because the calculation of an Israeli attack on Iran is to bring the United States into a war with Iran. Uh, hope, I mean, the Israel has been hoping that Iran would retaliate for, for the explosion at Natanz, for the killing of its nuclear scientists, for the sabotage that's been happening in Iran, because then that would derail the, 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 um, uh, the talks and it would, it would get the United States into a confrontation with Iran, which would keep the United States in the Middle East, which is something Israel and many other Arab countries want. So Iranians have so far resisted that kind of retaliation. There have been cyber attacks, but they haven't gone far beyond that. Uh, so, yes, I, I don't think Israel wants the talks to succeed. They also don't, uh, they also have no plan other than essentially eventually getting the United States into a military confrontation with Iran. And, but for the United States, if the United States does not want war with Iran, if the president is serious that we don't want any more forever wars, that we have bigger fish to fry in Asia and domestically and with pandemic, then it, it has to find a way to de-escalate with Iran. That doesn't mean a peace yes. treaty, does not mean a solution, but, but you have to find a way to back away from the brink, which means the Iranians have to be able to eat. The money that yes. Mr. Bennett speaks to doesn't I, go to the leadership, it goes to people. Back away from the brink, I think, is sound advice. I hope people in the White House and State Department are still listening to you, Vali. Always appreciate you coming on the show. Vali Nasa, thank you. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.